Welcome back to Badger Blitz TV, your Rivals.com destination for all things Wisconsin athletics. I'm Matt Perkins, joined by BadgerBlitz.com publisher and editor-in-chief, John McNamara. Good to see you as always, buddy. Absolutely, Matt. Good to see you, too. Um, We had some more great questions from the Badgers Den today, so we are just going to hop right into it here on a Monday morning. A little bit quieter, John, uh, last couple weeks. Obviously, it is the dead period in recruiting, but that doesn't mean that we are in a dead period. It never stops for us here at Badger Blitz TV. Um, Shout out to everyone in the Badgers Den who has been tuning in, giving us questions, giving us feedback. For all of you not members of BadgerBlitz.com, make sure you you get subscribed uh, to Badger Blitz here in the run-up to the season because you're not going to find any better intel anywhere in the known universe than what we get from John. Um, But we are going to start out uh, today on our show um, by talking, just sort of finishing up here with the 2025 class. Uh, Obviously, Muiz Tankara uh, uh, committed to Arizona over the weekend. Um, The Badger, he was sort of going to be the last maybe piece in the wide receiver class. But... um, Out here um, in the Badger's Den on the board, um, uh, we've got people asking specifically Super Badger, one of our one of one of our top people over there in the den. Soup wants to know now that the bulk of the class is committed, where do you see them uh, potentially looking to add? Obviously, defensive line, um, wide receiver. Are they looking up to sort of, uh, or are they going to be satisfied with what they have right now? I think obviously one name that we've talked about a lot here, John, is Kate Petrack. Um, I think he's sort of still their top remaining target on the board, along with Zadian Gentry at cornerback, the current SMU commit who they've been working on flipping for a while but john any other places you see this class sort of filling out yeah when when super badger asks a question you know that he wants to talk about the defensive line so um yeah. like you said matt it's you know kate petrack is the lone person who visited in june who is still uncommitted that wisconsin was able to bring on campus and you know like you and i have talked about before he's going to be a take for wisconsin you know, regardless of, you know, what that class looks like and how many commits they have and stuff like that. So um, I think the the greater question is, does Wisconsin for sure want to get to three? Um, you know, they have Wilnerson, Telemach, they they have Torn Petaway. Do they want to get to three, uh, you know, going into the fall? And I think that would, unless P-Track does commit, that would take, you know, throwing out a few offers if, if need be um, to some prospects who, you know, maybe you take a look at those first three games of their senior film and, the, and they really kind of blow up. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, the other side of the coin is that they could very well say we have two guys, we'll still fight for P-Track and then we feel good about that position. Now, I know that fans will hear that and it'll make them upset because they want to add more bodies to that position. But I would just say it's not a guarantee that they they absolutely want to get to three in this class. But it's certainly something that could happen. That's obviously a position to watch, you know, going into the fall. And then, I mean, like you talked about a cornerback, um, Zay Gentry is a guy that, like P-Track, visited officially in June. Um, it's basically Wisconsin and SMU, the school he's committed to. You know, the, the biggest thing is that hurdle of can you get him out of Texas? Can you get the family feeling good about that move? Um, you know, when I checked in recently, you know, things are, are kind of trending in the right direction from a Wisconsin point of view. Uh, but that's not necessarily a, a done deal just yet. You know, Zay hasn't come out and said that, you know, my decision will be official by, you know, date X. But, um, you know, that's that would be a significant gift for Wisconsin, especially after, you you know, losing Rakeem Stroud um, just recently to a decommitment to stay closer to home in Florida. I think obviously the one other guy that's a take no matter what is Byron Lewis, the running back um, out of Florida. If if you can get him, obviously it's it's been him or bust at the running back position for a couple months now, I would say. And you know, so I think that's part of the one other name I would keep an eye on. But it's really the, I can't think of anyone beyond those three guys unless there's someone who really blows up as a senior in their first three games of tape. You know, obviously, you know, 
Clinton and I have talked about that for years. You know, the first three first three games of senior year can be a spot where guys who you know who take a big jump, who might, maybe are late bloomers, uh, mm-hmm. can sort of uh, you know elevate to that next level. But I would be I'd be a little bit surprised if you get a commitment from anyone that's not one of those three names. Um, you know, sort of going going forward. I would tend to agree, and that's that's kind of been the situation Wisconsin's been in really since the summer official visits have happened, you know, they've gone into the fall largely locked up. Um, you know, there's, there's a, uh, you know, a scholarship or two available, you know, in each cycle. And I think Wisconsin can be a similar position here, but you know, they're, they're largely locked up right now. Um, and you know, if, if there is a kid that, you know, a kid or two that they get up for an official visit, it will be most likely from that category of we like, what we saw from that first three weeks of senior tape, you know, he's a late bloomer. He has measurables that we just can't really pass up, you know, from Wisconsin point of view. So, um, you know, I would, like, I, like you said, man, I, I guess I'd be surprised if, if it didn't come from one of those three guys. And, you know, you touched on Lewis a little bit. I think Wisconsin is probably number four from that group of top, you know, four, he's got Miami, Georgia, uh, Florida state. So that one would be surprising if, uh, you know, Wisconsin were to get him, but I, I think the longer it kind of plays out, maybe those schools fill up. Wisconsin's basically in a Lewis or bus position. So you never know in recruiting how things can kind of shake out, especially with those teams. You know, they're going not just after Lewis, but you know, a handful of other guys at tailback and Wisconsin can pitch. You are our top guy that we want. And you are the only guy we will take in this class. So that's, that's something that unique that the Badgers can, can kind of offer there in his recruitment. And I think that sort of on top of that, you know, I, I mean, I think we've learned in this 18 months with the staff, like don't count out Max and Pat like, yeah, and, and, and Casey, because we've seen them pull guys that you, we wouldn't necessarily expect. I mean, even just go back Eugene Hilton. I mean, Eugene Hilton, huge, huge recruit. I mean, Georgia offer like offers from everywhere. And the fact that even with a coaching change, Pat Lambert was able to keep that relationship going and get him into Madison. Uh, with you know with Kenny Guyton it is just it's a real testament to the work that that this staff is doing um speaking of the staff uh it looks like the Badgers might be looking to keep expanding that player personnel department the ever important player personnel department one of the names that's been thrown around is Carl St. Cyr um but uh who's down at LSU John how do you see this staff you know sort of evolving and moving forward uh in over the next you know six to 12 to 18 months do you, i mean we, obviously one of the things you mentioned was you know the potential of adding a guy like saint Cyr, but uh just sort of i guess from a bigger picture standpoint how do you feel about you know the direction of the player personnel staff well i, I think if you take anything from this it's that the staff is expected to grow and people that are listening to this which are most likely diehard recruiting fans should absolutely like the the tone of that and um, you know, there was a, you know, that, that morning where, you know, football scoop came out and said, you know, Wisconsin's targeting, uh, you know, the guy from Notre Dame, his name kind of escapes me who held the same title as, as Max does. I, that kind of put people in an uproar, but, you know, getting a chance to talk to some people, um, you know, they're looking to expand, not to replace Max. And I think that, you know, the entire Wisconsin community kind of let out a sigh of relief there. So, uh, you know, I think you're just you're seeing the emphasis on recruiting and developing that department and continuing to build it out. And, you know, when you have guys like Max and Pat, you know, that's great. But, you know, I think that if Max does get an elevated role, again, this is just kind of speculation on my part. But, you know, would he take a general manager type role where he's overseeing basically like an NFL gen- general manager would with roster potentially, you know, the, the money aspect of it, uh, position by position, like what we need in terms of numbers, in terms of scholarship guys, you know, I think, I think that is something that could potentially happen if you do find someone that to, to kind of take on his current title. And, uh, they're absolutely looking right. I, you know, they're, I think they're scouring, you know, a ton of programs to see if there's kind of an up and up and coming young, energetic guy that fits, into that department that they want to add. And, um, you know, I, I certainly would expect that they do add someone. I don't know when that would be. Um, but I do expect them to add to that recruiting department. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, just who that might be. 
I th- I think that with the direction of college football in general, I don't know if I don't think you can have enough people in the recruiting department. I I, I no. really don't because the emphasis on relationships, especially as people in the player personnel department, especially those higher up, tend to stick around longer than assistant coaches. And we've talked about here many times before the importance of these relationships with recruits and the relationships with guys on the current roster, you know, the the first not not the first, one of the first people that they're going to meet in the whole process of getting to know the University of Wisconsin is going to be Max Pat Casey and so you, you know you want to if you are a competitive pro you want to keep those guys around because not only does do you, do you trust their evaluations but you also you know want to that that's going to help you keep your talent in house with those kinds of relationships. So I, I think that is going to be a big, uh, you know, sort of point of emphasis for this staff kind of moving forward. Uh, flipping that, though, towards, you know, sort of larger uh, recruiting in the Big Ten with the expanded Big Ten. The giant has risen, had a, you know, it's kind of a two part question here. Um, we'll start with the first part. How do you feel about the new members of the conference? How do you feel like they will, will fare in recruiting Midwest prospects, the, these West Coast teams, your Oregons, your USC's, et cetera? And and how does uh, the addition of the four West Coast programs open the door for the Midwest teams to potentially get more prospects from the West Coast? Yeah, a lot to dive into with that question. Um, I think to start first with, you have seen schools obviously come into the Midwest. I mean, USC comes to mind. You know, they offer Torn Petaway. Um you know, Washington comes to mind. They were in on, you know, Dominic Kirks, who was a guy that uh, took an official to Wisconsin last cycle. So, um, you know, you're seeing schools from the West Coast come into, you know, quote unquote, Big Ten territory, which now, I, you know, it's just kind of national. You know, there is no set territory anymore. Uh, so, you know, you've seen those schools that are entering, maybe try to make a larger footprint. You know, you you at UCLA with Rob Booker, you know, they had him committed for a period of time. So I think you're seeing that from those schools of saying, Hey, we're going to be playing out there. We're going to be in these States to play. Let's go offer some of these kids because they'll be familiar with our name, our brand, and you know, everything that kind of goes into that. Um, you know, from a Wisconsin lens, you really haven't seen them go into California. Um, there's not a ton of offers that have went out there. So it's not, Maybe something that they're saying, hey, we're, we're going to play UCLA. We're going to play USC. Let's put some offers out there um, because the offers, if I don't have it in front of me, but I mean, they're, they're minimal, if any, from California or Washington, um, you know, from, from the West Coast. Or obviously, they dipped in Arizona. They got Logan Powell. But I don't think you've seen maybe the same, you know, emphasis from Wisconsin, whereas I think they're really kind of targeting the states that they feel good about, the, the relationships they have. At the, at the current, you know, programs, are, you know, largely in the Midwest, a lot of East Coast stuff that they've kind of relied upon. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of, you know, turns out over you know, time once these schools do get established here, once they start playing in other Big Ten stadiums. So, you know, I, I guess right now it hasn't really impacted Wisconsin specifically, but you have seen, you know, those schools from the, the, the lost Pac-12 or whatever you want to saw the defunct Pac-12 come in and start to offer uh, you know some kids from the Midwest and specifically you know just you know a torn pet away from from the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin offered in the 2025 cycles has four known offers to kids from California. Um, three of those are you know rivals 250 guys. Uh, Jordan Davison, the top right rated running back in the country, who's going to end up at Oregon. Weston Port, a linebacker who ended up at uh, who's committed to UCLA. Marcus Harris, a wide receiver who's committed to Oklahoma, and then they had an early offer out to Peter Lange, who is a 2025 offensive lineman, but they're filled up at that position, so I don't think. You know, that one is not really going to be, you know, out there much. I think if they do, I think when Wisconsin does go out to California, especially when it comes to recruiting, you know, you're going big game hunting. You're not going to spend the resources going for, you know, maybe a developmental guy. You're probably going to be able to find a similar developmental guy in the Midwest. It's going to be a lot more cost effective to recruit than bringing out someone from California. Yeah. And, you know, the guys you mentioned, Matt, if I'm not mistaken, those are, Paul Christ offers, you know, a guy like Port mm-hmm. was a guy that he visited real early, you know, his sophomore year, maybe Wisconsin offered him. Um, I don't know if people remember, you know, Wisconsin, 
kind of late in the Paul Christ era, like offered like 20 kids from Matter Day, maybe, or a, one of those yep, other powerhouses. Yep. Yeah, they tried to get like 11 of them to come out for a, like a mass visit. Yeah, I think that like was that, that was actually that that was once Jim Leonard was the head coach. That was a a Jim Leonard led effort. Yeah, and that uh, that didn't get much traction. Um, but hey, I applaud the effort. Why not? Why not splash a big high school like that? Um, but you know, in in the same conversation, you've seen a school like UCLA go out and recruit an SEC country, have a little bit of success, but now they've seen some decommitment. So. Distance is always going to be a factor in whatever school that you are passionate about or school that you're covering. It's it's tough to break that barrier with kids. It, it just is. I'm surprised that you know USC isn't maybe putting a bigger focus on California and the West Coast because you know they have the appeal there, they have the brand there. Now I think that's a school that can recruit nationally, but they have noticed now that. You know, you might have some initial success, but then when those SEC schools start kind of tighten the screws there, they end up winning those recruiting battles. And they're kind of seeing what, you know, the Wisconsin's of the world have faced and, you know, the schools that need to go into the state of Florida, the state of Georgia to get, you know, cornerbacks, receivers. It's difficult when you are in SEC country and you're trying to get a kid out to the Midwest, the West Coast. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, the schools that have had historically the best luck from the from the Big Ten going to California, at least in the past decade or so, is going to be Ohio State and Michigan, bigger brands, mm-hmm. bigger budgets, et cetera. Uh, we saw um, uh, C.J. Stroud was a California guy who ended up at Ohio State and did really well there. Um, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, uh, in this class alone, you know, I'm just looking at the rivals recruiting database. Like Ohio State offered 14 prospects for, from California for 2025. I think all but two of them were four stars or five stars. So again, you you look at them going out and trying to get these bigger, you know, these bigger names, but they haven't landed any of those guys. Um, and, and and that's Ohio State. That is you know the elite recruiting program in the Big Ten. So uh, it is not easy for anyone to go out there because because Oregon and USC and at this point, honestly, like Alabama have such a stranglehold on the top talent out there from the West Coast. It is going to be hard. It's going to be a little bit easier now that, you know, they're going to be more exposure for your Wisconsin's, your Illinois, your Iowa's, your, you know, just by the fact that they are going to be playing games on the West Coast every year. But that still doesn't make it easy to recruit out there. Absolutely. I I agree 100 percent. And then um, second part of that question, then uh, from uh, the giant has risen, still one of my favorite names on the board anywhere. Uh, When looking at the West Coast teams, does composition of their rosters and recruiting lend itself to success in the new look Big Ten? So basically, how are these four new teams? How are they going to be competitive and how will those styles fit into the Big Ten, in your opinion, John? It's a great question. Um, And I you know, I, I think that you can speculate. I think the biggest thing is, you know, can USC come and play at 11 o'clock, you know, against Rutgers, uh, you know, in, in November? I mean, that that's a significant travel. That's a change in weather. That's, that's different for them. Um, I, I think it's going to take a while to get adjusted to it's, it's just going to be different, you know, and you could argue that, you know, Wisconsin has to go out and play, uh, USC and you know, UCLA and all, you know, but I, I think that, you know, the temperature is, is something, right. It's, it's something that they will have to adjust to. Um, I think back to when Wisconsin played, you know, Miami in, was it the champ sports bowl and you know, Lan- Lance Kendricks was playing in that game and it was like 50 degrees and you saw the Miami guys, they have like, you know, winter jackets on, they're sitting in front of the heaters and, you know, Wisconsin, I mean, that's, that's good football weather for that's, Wisconsin. That's, that's, that's short little, sleeves, so, man. Like, yeah, that's, 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 that's short sleeves all day long. So I'm not saying it's going to be that, you know, impactful or that dramatic. I mean, with the amount of resources that these programs have, I mean, they will do everything to get them adjusted to it, to prep them for it and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, but the travel and the the weather, it's, it's going to be different. So I think that, you know, I don't have a great answer for you to say this is exactly how it's going to roll out. But I think a lot of people are curious to see. You know, what's it going to look like for, for a West School school to come and play potentially in the snow? It's, it's, it's going to be interesting. And I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing how that kind of shakes out as well. I think Oregon is going to be fine, personally, uh, just because of, I mean, 
that we've seen them come in to win at Ohio State in the last couple of years. Uh, we've seen them travel and do really well. Obviously, like, you know, in the snow, I think is, is a different question. But, I mean, Washington is not, you know, not used to playing in the snow. I mean, I've seen plenty of Apple Cups against Washington State where they've had to, you know, play in the snow. Games against Colorado and Utah late in the season, you're likely to see snow as well. So mm-hmm. um, I, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world for them. I think it's going to be tougher for USC and UCLA. Um, than it is for those two teams from, you know, the Pacific Northwest, Um, you know, especially with the style of play that USC has in in Lincoln Riley's offense, the the timing really gets affected the colder it gets. And so that is, that's probably gonna be the biggest question for me is going to be road games in November for USC, UCLA. Um, And uh, on the flip side, you know, some of the, you know, if you're Rutgers or if you're Penn state traveling out to Eugene, Oregon, man, going from state college, Pennsylvania to Eugene, Oregon is brutal. I mean, it is travel wise. There is no air. There is no major airport near either school. Right. Like, you know, I mean, you fly to Portland, but to get from, you know, Happy Valley to 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 Eugene, you got to probably connect twice to get there. It's going to be it's going to be a tough, tough, tough place to go i mean same thing for like a purdue right same thing you know for some of these teams that aren't close to to major airports and in traveling so it's going to be very interesting to see i'm most curious to see how it affects the olympic sports personally um i was just going to say that yeah um that uh you know it's going to be a a very very uh fun and interesting and and exciting time if if i'm being quite frank with you i'm i'm very excited about this you know i do feel sad that you know kind of the rose bowl i I was already sad when the rose bowl really lost its meaning at the beginning of the um you know even at the beginning of the, the the bcs era really but especially in the cfp era the rose bowl doesn't quite mean the same thing as it did john when we started watching college football yeah, right uh, absolutely. When, when you, you and i were young 30 years ago you know watching you know you know going back to you know all, all the classic games not just the wisconsin ones but in, you know any of those classic games between big 10 and pac 12 the you know pour one out for the pack 12 which is now the pack two um but <laughs> I, I i'm still though i'm i'm excited about it it's it's something new it's something exciting and it, and it gets me excited you know i you know obviously wisconsin is in my blood but so is ucla i went to grad school at ucla and so i i'm excited to be able to see ucla coming a little bit closer to home maybe catch a Bruins game here and there and to see what deshaun foster can do that team is uh probably expected to struggle the most of the uh, of the four programs coming in but you know i I think that there's a chance somewhere in the future with with investment that ucla can become a power again we've seen them be great before it is tough the rose bowl is nowhere near the ucla campus that is a really tough sell at some times but when that place is going and when that team is going it is it's a special special place to not just take in a football game but just sort of to be there so um we're gonna finish off today uh john uh with an either or who is most likely to play early dylan jones or darian dupree and why well you know off, before we got going matt gave me some some inf- inside information uh but it, it didn't sway my pick too much it kind of just kind of reaffirmed what i i thought and um look i those two guys are as talented, I think, as of, of running backs that Wisconsin's brought in over the last, you know, handful of years, I expect, you know, big things from from both. Both are unique. Uh, you know, I think that Jones gives you a more traditional between the tackles type guy. Um, but my pick is Dupree because of the the skill set that he does bring, because of the receiving threat that he does bring. And because I, I think that he is exactly what they want from a running back in in this offense. You know, right when that staff took over, Dupree was the first guy that the, that they offered, and obviously he's someone that they knew from you know their time at Cincinnati. But I think he was the first story I wrote from the new coaching staff and, and the new offers that they were putting out. And at the time, it was uh, Gino, Coach Gino. I can't pronounce his last name. I couldn't pronounce it a year ago when he was still on staff. Um, you know, he was 
because he had that connection to him at Cincinnati. I remember that he offered right away and obviously they got Dupree, but you know, like I said, he, I think he is exactly what they want in a running back that is versatile to do a number of different things. I think it's, it's hard to be that traditional running back to come in and, and run between the tackles. But if you're talking about who's going to potentially play the most, I think it's Dupree because you can use him in a number of different ways. I, you know, he obviously as a, as a tailback, you can use him, but I think that he could play in the slot if you needed him to jet sweeps. I, I think that his skill set is so diverse that that will allow him to be on the field more than Jones, who again, I think is that kind of typical traditional tailback that Wisconsin's had over the last, you know, I don't know, 30 years or so, but both, I, I think both are going to be very good players if they stay healthy, if they kind of progress in the way the coaching staff believes that they can, um, I think Dupree play. I you know I think Dupree's a guy who burns his red shirt. I'm not sure about the other two. Yeah, I just from talking with people in the program around the program, Dupree is so advanced as a receiver already that it's going to be so hard to keep him off the field. Um, and if, if I were a betting man, John, I would say that there are probably three true freshmen this year that see playing time. Um, and you know, Dupree is one of them. Uh, uh, no tackle Dylan Johnson is one of them. And Thomas Heiberger is almost a lock to be a core special teamer already. Um, he, he sounds like someone who the coaching staff just loves his motor and his size. And I can, I, I see him being, you know, being one of the top gunners on, on, on yeah. punt. I see him being kickoff, kick return. And, you know, he, he might get a couple of defensive snaps here and there, but you know, Wisconsin is pretty loaded at outside linebacker. So it might be tough to crack that rotation, but he's going to be someone who we definitely see the field as, as a core special teamer. You know, I, I think he might come along like someone like a, a, like a Christian Allegro a little bit, obviously different positions at linebacker, but just someone who's physically advanced and is already there. But speaking at, at you know, at the running back position, they bring in three guys. And I think that Jones is very similar to Ches Malusi in a lot of ways. Gideon Atuka and Tawi Walker are cut from identical cloth, but Dupree is different from everyone else. And that's why he's probably going to be able to see the field see the field early. And so if I were a betting man, I would definitely say that you know, Dupree, um, you know, not, not just sees the field, but, but has an impact. Is it going to be tough to find opportunities in slot? Maybe. I mean, already the Badgers, probably their best weapon is Will Pauling. Tretch Kakahuna was, was huge in the bowl game and has taken big, big strides and is one of the f- pure fastest players on the team. But du- Dupree is just so versatile that it's, it's going to be tough, man. It's going to be really, really tough. So um, what's not tough though, John, hanging out with you every Monday morning. Uh, one of the best parts of my week. Uh, that is going to do it for us here on Badger Blitz TV. Please uh, like, subscribe, rate, review, unsubscribe, resubscribe, re-rate, re-review uh, to us here on uh, Badger Blitz TV on YouTube. Make sure you're subscribing to BadgerBlitz.com for all of the best intel and information and writing anywhere in Badgerland. Uh, we appreciate everyone tuning in. And until next time, we'll see you in the den.